Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we have Dr. Patrick Flynn, and we are going to talk about nutrition. We're going to talk about weight loss. We're going to be talking about fasting. We're going to be talking about your liver. So, so much great stuff. Welcome Dr. Patrick Flynn. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be with you guys today. So tell us a little bit of your background, a little bit of what got you into nutrition and weight loss and just what got you passionate about where you're at right now. Yeah, I was a, I was grew up in a Northern town of Wisconsin in a little small community town and I was a sick kid. And what happened is I, in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, I didn't get help by conventional medicine. So I ended up looking for different ways of doing things that way, which led me into going to school, you know, with uh, nutrition and immunology. And, and then I went to the chiropractic school and, and it allowed me to actually see things from a different venue, um, especially the way, especially today, it's even more important because of the things that were so medically dominated thinking that I started to actually put some things together at a young age, even as a teenager, that really inspired me to actually dig into it deep. And, and even some of the things that we were taught back then um, have, are, have made more relevance even today. And then what happened is uh, how things has transpired when I actually met my girlfriend, aka my wife now of 20 years, um, she had some major hormonal issues and didn't realize that they're all tied together with the things I was learning and having such a different perspective on this. It allowed me to figure out some hormonal things, which obviously led when you deal with women, deals with metabolic things, deals with liver issues, deals with hormonal issues that all connect together. And so I kind of over the 23 years put together an incredible um office here in Green Bay, which I started in 1999 to now that we have offices all over the world, uh, which is kind of nice and sharing the same information, but put it in clinical practice every single day. Mm, I love that. Well, one of the things I'm interested in, I, I do definitely feel like something is off with my liver and I don't drink at all. I drink like maybe four times a year. I'm just not a drinker. I like to eat my calories, yeah. but I just I'm feeling like I need to do like a liver flush or a liver cleanse. And so I was reading all about the gallbladder and liver flush. And I wanted to hear what your take is on that, first of all, and just what is going on with people's people's liver now and your best way to kind of cleanse and flush that and detox. Yeah, I think, um, I think, flush detox cleanse are, are misleading terms because it's actually not really true physiological, biological, biochemical um, terms. Uh, they sound, you know, really interesting on, a, on our world today. But uh, if we kind of look at it a little bit different and um, the liver is by far the most regenerative organ that we do know of. I'm not saying that there isn't more regenerative organs. For example, even like our skin cells this morning, the ones that you wake up with by tomorrow, they're going to be regenerated. And the ones that are going to have are going to die off and we're going to have new ones. And so I want to make sure I have the right nutrition, the right things, less inflammation so the skin can regenerate, nothing inflammatory that leaves skin issues. Um, but when it comes to the liver, our liver is highly regenerative uh, because of what it does. And what it does is our, our if we, we have to look at our, our liver more like a organ of conversion, um, because here's what happens. If you think about this way, things that we eat, uh, things that we need to make, things that we need to change, uh, they can be absorbed and brought into our body and they go to our liver and they're converted. For example, um, if you just take about even weight loss itself, uh, the term metabolism, I want you to put synonymous with conversion. You take, it goes to the liver, it converts a fat soluble molecule to water so it can be rid out and gone. If it can't, then it needs to be stored. You say, I'm, and that's why people say, doc, you know, I actually have a, a, a weight loss problem. You really don't, you have a conversion problem. You're not converting your fat to, to break it down and go water soluble and get out. And of course, since you cannot metabolize that or convert that, guess what happens? Now it has to be stored. And then women like, I, I can't lose weight. Well, and if all you do is exercise and even eat better without restoring the liver back to normal, helping it regenerate. So the concept of detoxing or flushing um, is actually not really a good thing because here's what happens to this. Your body is meant to have a normal function. That's what you're genetically programmed for. That means your body is supposed to take something, go through its phases like liver as phase one, intermediate phase two. But if you're lacking certain nutrients, if you're lacking the enzymes, if you're lacking what you need, giving something to try to force something to work. You know, like if you want to jack up your adrenals, you can either do caffeine or you can give your adrenals what it needs so it can just work normally and don't have to wor worry about these big pushes and cycles because when you do that to your body, there's actually, there's a push, but then there's also a crash, okay? And when you look at the liver, it's very regenerative. That means it needs a significant amount of constituents and nutrients for it to even just work on a daily basis. 
And just by even eating liver alone, you actually produce so many good effects to it. Because I want you to think about the liver not being a high detoxing organ, because that's what people think it is. No, it's actually a very high enzymatic organ. It has major enzymes that you actually can, when something comes into it from like adipose tissue, a hormone, a chemical, it will use its enzymes to break and change it so it can be safely ridden from your body or safely converted in your body for other uses. For example, you're, you're, I would suspect you are still a cyclic woman, okay? Yes. Um, your hormone estradiol has to convert, could metabolize to different forms like 4-hydroxyesterone or estradiol or estrone itself or estriol to not be used by different parts of your body because those things are, are metabolized and converted. They're not produced. So your liver converts them so other tissues can use them. If there is deficiencies in the liver, if there's actually toxic effects and damage to liver, one of the most common diseases in all people, even kids today, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, where the liver, for example, gets bound up by an overconsumption of sugar, an overconsumption of, of toxic things. And now there's damage to it. And now we lose some of those enzymatic processes. So now we can't convert. That means we leave toxins circulate in our system that are supposed to be rid. We leave adipose tissue being stored in our system because we can't do that. We have hormones that can't convert to one form or the other. And if it's a form that causes your breast tissue to grow on a regular basis, then guess what happens? You can have a breast cancer. So there's, so that organ plays a major role, especially in women, men too. It's just that a little bit more in women because their full metabolic process depends on that organ. Mm, I love that. One of the things that's going on with me is literally sometimes it's the first day of my period and sometimes it's the fourth day of my period. I get a migraine headache so bad yeah. that it was happening about once a quarter and it, it happens so much that I literally will throw like this last time I threw yeah. up 15 times just was in bed. I couldn't do anything. And then about eight hours later, I was fine. And yep. I moved on with my day. What do you think that? And, and it's funny because I've, because I mentioned that, I guess on, on one of my yeah. podcasts, I've had other people say, oh my gosh, same thing is happening to me. Some people yeah. it's happening on day one of their period. Some people day two, some people day three, some people day four, and it's happening more and more. A good friend of mine came over and I told her what happened. She said, you won't believe it. Same thing happened to me. What do you think is going on there? Well, Multiple things. Number one, there's something inflammatory. Let's just start there because whenever you have that kind of headache, that's actually the, which, which people don't realize a headache is actually truly brain inflammation. Now that can happen for multiple reasons. When, when you actually have your menstrual cycle, think of this, when you actually have day one of your period or through day, and obviously ladies, you're supposed to menstruate five to seven days minimally. Anybody that only menstruates three, four days, you actually are, it's, it's a bad state to be in because you're actually not going to produce enough hormone or produce enough uh, dumping of the lining that could build up some more problems. But then here's what happens. Day, the menstrual cycle, the period process that way of you know five to seven days is meant to think this way. Take tissue that was produced, break it down and rid it. Now, when it cannot do that, it just recirculates. People do not realize that, for example, if you actually have you know estrogen levels, is because there's multiple estrogen levels within our system that are supposed to fluctuate through the month. And actually a woman's hormones fluctuate four times in the month. It's, it's significant when they actually are in a state of their period, because number one through day five, you're going to drop estrogens at a very low level. Your progesterone is going to level. Those hormones have to metabolize out. And if they don't, they can become aggravating to the system. That's why you can have emotions, you can have pain, you can have inflammation, you have brain changes, you, can have, you can have body changes, you can have breast changes. And that's why it's important to know that those things have to convert out in order to them to do what? to actually go to a low level so your body can do its function when it does. When it doesn't, now think of it this way, from a nutrition standpoint, if I give the average person with the exception of an allergy to this, a bowl of broccoli, most people are gonna get some benefit, okay? If I give you 10 bowls of broccoli, uh, most people are gonna throw up because anything with an excess that does not metabolize out is actually a poison. So the lowest levels of hormones in a woman are from day one when they get to period through day five to seven. And therefore, if those hormones do not change, they can be very inflammatory for all areas of the body, including the brain of women. And that's why it's important to actually make sure that, that that's there. So what happens is this, and I mean this sincerely, ladies, if you hold any kind of weight, any kind of weight, you have a liver metabolism issue. You really do. And then what happens with also women 
that day one through five is going to sound interesting. And let's say, let's say you menstruate seven. So let's call the week. Um, you're going to find out that once again, your sugar consumption during that first week can cause massive inflammatory things, even, even brain inflammation due to the fact that when you actually already have a problem converting things in your liver and you consume sugar, the liver has to actually convert that and store it or rid it. And it can't, it's going to leave you very inflammatory for other things, especially during that with day one through seven. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a product that I'm completely obsessed with right now. It's called Buy Optimizers, and one of them is called Magnesium Breakthrough. And the reason why I love it so much is because it has all seven forms of magnesium in one bottle. It literally upgrades virtually every function in your body, like helps you with your sleep, helps you with stress, which I'm under a lot of stress right now, working a lot. And then the second one is called Mass Imes, and it's a really potent enzyme blend for digestive function. And so we literally did a test with this. It was so cool with steak. And then we put the mass imes in there and it literally broke down the steak. So if you're like getting tired after you're eating, you need this because it will optimize your digestion and really help you with absorption and absorbing those nutrients. So I have really good news. If you go to magbreakthrough.com slash Chantel Ray, that's magbreakthrough.com slash Chantel Ray, you will get a discount code. You've got to try it. I love it. So what is the best way to get your liver to metabolize the way that you want it to? Well, give us some practical tips that, yeah. that we can do for that. It's, it's like a car engine. It needs sufficiency. It needs fuel. Okay. So I know I'm going to, this is where I differ. And this is my, this is one thing. If you, if I were to ever show you my college textbooks, but you can pick this up quite interesting in any textbook that has anything to do with nutrition, the most nutrient dense foods in the world by far. And they are the true superfoods. And they're true superfoods that have been used on every continent across the world since the beginning of time. That's why I love when, you know, this whole term superfood has getting really overblown. For example, you can find a superfood that was in Africa or Brazil or some remote island. And then because of shipping and information, now they distribute it all over the world. And they're like, look at there, there is a, here's a superfood, the acai berry and all things like that, or it's native to some country that was not all over the, all over the world. So how do we survive for generations before we had shipping? How do we survive before we had, the true superfoods are still actually organ meats. Organ meats on every continent across the world since the beginning of time have been normal consumption. They are by far in any nutrition book. So you give me any vitamin and people do not realize Vitamins actually don't have a lot of, or excuse me, vegetables don't have a lot of vitamins. They don't. You say, yeah, doc, a carrot has beta carotene. Well, the purpose of beta carotene is to become vitamin A. There is no fat, so there is no um, vegetable that has vitamin A, they have beta carotene. And guess where beta carotene has to convert in order to become vitamin A? In the liver. So if you have a liver problem, you can even eat all the beta carotene you want. It can't even convert into its form. Can't metabolize into the form it needs that way. So when you look at organ meats, they're by far the most dominant. So what actually being specialized in women for 23 years, one of the most important things I ever did to women is actually getting them to start to consume some liver. Why? Because all those, when you eat organic grass-fed raw liver that way, or even a capsulated form, um, or even eat it cooked, you actually have great enzymatic processes and the ability to regenerate that liver like crazy. On the flip side, that's a little easier than my next thing I tell women, or even guys to do that way, is you have to reduce your consumption of sugar. See, it's very common for, uh, for people to know that fatty liver disease is, is very common in alcoholics because the high consumption of sugar and fructose and everything that bombards the liver uh, uh, causes major problems and causes scarring and causes the, the, some significant damage. And that's why you see all these problems with the liver that comes from alcoholism that way. But on the flip side, the, 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 that a person consumes glucose on a regular basis too much or too often and that's why, that's why intermittent fasting got so popular because what you just did is you just took some, uh, a little timing off the amount of liver that you, that you need. And then in your morning, your cortisol jumps up, which now gets more circulation of, of, of uh, sugar. So it pulls it from the adipose tissue, pulls it from muscles, pulls it from the liver. And that's why people see a benefit from it. Um, but the whole topic of intermittent fasting, we'll get on a second that way, because I think it's really misleading on so many things because you're really not fasting just because you skipped breakfast. Okay. I think it makes people feel more emotionally better thinking they're fasting. You don't fast for at least three days. You're not really fasting. That's actually, that's actually true biology by that way, but it's so intimate. They should just say, I'm skipping a meal. 
you're not really fasting. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your best tips for mm-hmm. fasting and intermittent fasting. Kind of what yes. are things that people are doing right? What are people doing wrong? And what do yep. they need to improve on? I love that because here's what happens. I'm going to give you a very different perspective because it's not so singular as people think. People say both men and women. And I'm very, I'm very cautious about ever having a woman fast ever. Okay. Just because of what it can do to their whole system. Um, and let, let's start here. It's essential for males to fast minimally 72 hours with just water, maybe some coffee um, every three months. It's essential. Men need to fast to actually and I'm talking fast. I'm not talking intermittent fast because the concept of intermittent fasting, let me give you an example. We all know this from basic biology. If I were to eat um, in our, no joke, literally I had an organic duck egg before I came up here. Okay. Had some beef tallow cooked up beef tallow that way. Um, had an amazing uh, organic duck egg. And guess what happens from the time that that actually hits my mouth to the time that it leaves my rectum, to where I'm not absorbing nutrients or producing nutrients from it, it's about three to five days. Three to five days. So that's why people skip a meal in the morning or make a window fasting of, let's say, I only eat between between six and nine o'clock um, every single day. You're not fasting. You're not. Sorry, guys, you're not. Because true fasting is when you've depleted your whole digestive system of any nutrients for consumption. So therefore, until you hit three days, and then if you're lucky, if your digestion is bad, it may take five days before you actually clear your whole digestive system out and you're still, you're still eating. Do you know what I'm saying? It's just that you're not putting anything in your mouth, but your system has food in there. Your microbial uh, aspects are producing B vitamins, different things like that. Uh, because remember, to get through your small intestine, yeah, maybe it might take 12 to 18 hours to get there. But then it'll sit in your large intestine producing and digesting and eating it. And your, your microbiome are actually producing other vitamins and you're stealing things from there. You're getting rid of it that way. And that's why I tell people, you really want to truly get fast and you got to go at least 72 hours. And guys, it's extremely essential. And guys should push as long as they possibly can. They really should because it affects their testosterone levels at a high rate, which is fantastic. Um, you know, and you hear all things about autophagy and all things. Yes, those are all true, but that just happens just from reduction of calories and reduction of actually your insulin levels, which is, which is fantastic. I'm totally for it. So remember, I'm not against intermittent fasting. I think that we have to just get rid of the concept that you're calling it fasting because you're truly not fasting men or women until you get past two or three days minimal. Okay. Second of all, when you look at the concept of women, women got to be very careful with this. Okay. Because here's what happens to this. If we, you, in order to actually really know if a woman can actually fast, she has to check her stress hormones. When a woman's under extremely high stress, um, fasting is not a good thing. It's actually really bad for them, actually. Um, now, if, they're, if their adrenals are weak, it's actually essential for them to fast. But you got to remember, your adrenals fluctuate through the day and your hormone production fluctuates through the day. And, and it's why when people started to skip meals in the morning, both men and women, they see a positive aspect because um, if you look what happens with, um, with both men and women, Cortisol levels are elevated in the morning. Gets us going, gives us, gets our blood sugar going. Uh, because once again, as cortisol, cortisol regulates our blood sugar, not insulin. Insulin gets actually blood sugar into our cell. But what actually brings out uh, sugar into our system is actually cortisol. Well, of course, when cortisol jumps up, starts to rise about three in the morning, peaks between seven and eight, guess what happens? Well, of course, by not having sugar, by not having sugar, what happens or not having a meal in the morning, your body says, I need sugar. So it's going to pull from our system. It's going to pull from, it's going to cause our adrenals to put out not only cortisol, but adrenaline, epinephrine, and that'll get us going. So in in general, when when people are actually skipping meals in the morning, reducing their calorie intake, reducing their their consumption of that that available glucose, it's, it's fantastic. And that's why people do well if they've done that. Now, but the man, they can do that regardless of what their adrenals are like. But the woman, if their adrenals are high in the morning and they have high cortisol, they already have a significant amount of sugar within the system, okay? Uh, 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 abundant of it that way. And their adrenals are actually you know, going crazy. And so that's why sometimes when they are actually deficient majorly in their adrenals, it's good for them to fast in the morning because it'll, it'll, it'll cause a rise in that cortisol, which will get them going a little bit more compared to when that's too high. They, gotta, they actually got to eat something to actually bring it down. Now, I'll encourage them to eat more like fat or some protein and stuff, but mainly fat. 
because that will actually create the, the reduction of that cortisol, reduction of sugar, which now allow them to actually do one of things because if that cortisol is elevated too high for a long time, they'll start to store fat even if they're fasting. All right, I'm going to ask two questions. Um, they kind of, well, I'll ask the first one. This is from Anna Marie. She yeah. says, today is my seventh day into fasting. My window is now 21-3. I'm sitting here thinking if this is the right item to eat, two eggs and two slices of toast when I break my fast. Is that too much? I normally have cottage cheese and macadamia nuts and berries. <laughs> The bread is multigrain. Please don't say I can eat what I want. I just want to know if this is too much. Thanks in advance. And she's talking about, is that too much food to initially break her fast? Two eggs and two slices of toast. Um, break her fast as far as like, I wonder what she means by break her fast because the minute you consume something, you're breaking the fast. But I would say- She's in I a 21-3 window. Three, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it won't. But uh, now remember, the one thing is this, I'm not a big grain person. Okay. I'm not just Me because, um, because here's what happens. This is there's a lot of grains, especially gluten. People don't realize is an anti-nutrient It not only is inflammatory, but it'll attach like phytic acid, which comes in grains. It's actually an anti-nutrient. It'll attach onto our iron. It'll attach onto our zinc. It'll withdraw nutrients. Now there are some exceptions. If you soak your, your grains and then produce them, right. But most people do not do that. Um, so I would say do the eggs, do the berries, um, things like that. That'd be a fantastic thing to do it during that time. Um, and on top of it, I'm going to throw a little caveat on there. I'd like to see where her adrenal pattern is. You could take a, take a sample four times in a day because that would be able to tell me her best times to eat. And also, you know, once again, if those things are significant, always remember this, everybody is the majority of our body is made up of fatty acids. That is proteins. That's carbohydrates. So we need all three. That's why this concept that we don't need carbohydrates is actually kind of ridiculous. And I know what they're doing. They're trying to reduce people's fat intake. But if I'm going to get a decent carbohydrate, I'm going to get it by my fruits. That's why I'm going to get some of my major carbohydrates that I want to get. Obviously, berries being number one. My favorite berries is actually blackberries and blueberries. But I'm a big blackberry fan, um, as long as you're not allergic to it, because you can be allergic to fruits. But the idea is this, is I would actually make sure that you continue, that you have more of a higher fat content of food. Do you say so therefore having that egg and, and an egg yolk is by far the most bioavailable protein there is. And so that's why I actually love egg yolks. Uh, they're fantastic for you. So I love that she's going to do yolks and, and some berries and some of that. So I think you won't be, you know, I think you'll be get rid of the grain. And I think that'd be a fantastic thing, not only to do during your window of fasting, but also to, to consume on a regular basis. Okay. And this next one's from Nancy. Today, I tried one tasting after 19 hour fast and then dinner. It went well. I'm mm -hmm. convinced I may not have eaten enough calories, but I stopped before full. What's considered too low of calories? So I think we should just discuss yep. this whole idea of people who are like, you know, how many calories do I eat? Am yep. I eating enough calories? Let's just talk about that. Yep. Well, remember, I always tell people this, if I'm looking at calorie intake and I'm talking somebody about calorie intake, um, we're going to talk mainly about grains and things like that. If you're eating, you know, once again, high dense foods like organ meats, and even just say even muscle meats or even, you know, good fats that way, I tell people never worry about calorie counting ever. You know what I'm saying? But if you're going to actually think about calorie intake when it comes to grains and things you shouldn't, yeah, I'd keep your calories down to a minimal. I'd keep it well below 2000 just because even eating all organic, eating grains and things like that, and you're going to, it's going to be a bad day. You, you put sufficiency of organ meats on there. Um, you put sufficiency of right things. You never have to worry about calorie counting ever. Yeah. And I think that one of the things is the only thing I like about um, calorie counting, I'm, I'm not a fan of calorie counting. I never have mm -hmm. been, mm -hmm. but in a few certain scenarios, when someone comes to me and they're like, I'm doing everything perfect. Like I'm doing this and I'm doing that and da, 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 and I'm not losing weight. Yep. Then, then I do like for people to really write it down and track it because there are times where you look at people and they're like, yeah, I'm eating, you know, two cups of nuts and two full avocados. And you, you know, they can get out of control with it. I mean, it's like, yeah, these are good foods and you're doing good, but you're, you are eating too much. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and so, and I, and I always want to challenge people on the idea of good food. Okay. Because mm -hmm. here's what happens. If those nuts are not soaked, they can be anti-nutrients. If you haven't had your food allergies tested, um, I can show you people that actually are allergic to broccoli, coconut, um, eggs, everything like that. My world, like I said, the reason why I actually got nutrition is because I have a egg allergy, a severe one. You know what I'm saying? 
And it, it popped up as an IgE, and which could be detrimental to me that way. So I always tell people it's like, I mean, all things, but on top of this, you can eat perfect things, even if you're allergic to them that way. If you are deficient and your liver cannot convert your fat soluble things to water soluble things, you can have a liver problem that can lead. And that's why you see a lot. That's why you see a lot of this. You ever watch, you know, big bodybuilders, they exercise like crazy, but look at their bellies. Oh, bellies. You know why they have bellies is because they have such a high consumption of, of actually proteins without sufficiency for your liver to be able to convert that fat to actually water. And what happens is high, high amount of muscle meats actually is really no different than sugar. It really isn't because a protein and a sugar are only off really by a nitrogen base. So when they eat that much protein with all, all the things needed, like an organ meat to actually help it convert, they actually just, your body converts it to sugar and stores it as fat. That's why people say, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm totally against, totally against protein shakes. These whole idea of these vegan protein shakes just drive me nuts. Um, you know, a good hemp shake and a good way, uh, um, um, uh, you know, brown rice shake and some of that. I'm like, guys, that's a bad day. Because if you're not adding some right things in there, that protein shake just turns right into sugar and it's not a good thing for you. And I know people are big. In, now, if you want to do something like collagen and things like that, I'm cool with that. But the, 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 the vegan, it's just a vegan protein is kind of, kind of funny to me. Do you say I'm, because it's not that you can't get some <laughs> decent amino acids from there, but you're not going to get your major building blocks from any vegan source of protein. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. I just got to laugh about that. <laughs> Love it. Well, this has been an honor. Please tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah. It's really simple. Like I said, uh, just go to the wellnessway.com. It's actually, um, we have a massive website with thousands of videos, uh, because we have clinics. Like I said, the, everything I'm talking to you guys about, um, as I'm in my huge studio here in Green Bay, my big corporate office, I have, uh, we have a full clinic in there. We have a corporate that runs all the offices across the world. Um, there's, there's uh, practicing doctors every single day in our offices and practitioners and of all different kinds from all healthcare professions that way. And, uh, but the wellnessway.com is actually our website to where you can see our clinics, you can see our videos, you can see itself, you can see all my interviews and everything because this is a kind of very common basis for us to do these because we're just putting out good information for people to really understand uh, a different way of doing things so they can actually live a very good, healthy life. That's it. And I'm hoping, and I'm hoping they never have to use a doctor. Love it. Well, this has been great. You guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.